Jamen, øh, så, så tillader jeg mig lige at tage ordet. Øhm, jeg starter lige på 10 tanker om landskabsarkitektur. 10 <laughs> Det vækker nemlig nysgerrighed. Og åbenlyst hos flere. Så hjertelig velkommen til jer alle sammen, der er kommet her til vores fornemme fine arkitektskole i Aarhus, hvor foreningen Danske Landskabsarkitekter i samarbejde med arkitektskolen, og Tom, du får lov til at sige, hvad jeg er studie. Du er design og landskab og arkitektur. Tak. Vi sammen er værter for denne her festforelæsning af den internationalt anerkendte svenske landskabsarkitekt Torbjørn Andersson. Jeg hedder Susanne René Grundkind og er formand for foreningen, og vi er ca. 800 landskabsarkitekter fra hele landet, der arbejder i alle skalaer, privat som offentligt, med planlægning, udvikling og design, forvaltning og drift af byens rum og grønne miljøer, og grønne miljøer både i byer og ude i landskabet. Og det betyder rigtig meget for os i foreningen at være relevante og vedkommende for alle. Det betyder meget for os, at landskabsarkitektur er helt fremme i alles bevidsthed. Vi arbejder hårdt for i foreningen og i bestyrelsen, at også omverdenen, borgere, kommuner, private bygherrer og politikere, ja alle, er klar over, hvor vigtigt det er med gode og smukke udemiljøer af høj kvalitet og hvorfor det er vigtigt. Vores mål med det arbejde er, at det vigtige budskab bliver spredt og bliver til en fælles forståelse. Altså ikke bare os landskabsarkitekter imellem, men alle. Det er vigtigt, at budskabet løber i forvejen og allerede er forankret i vores opdragsgivere og brugere, sådan så det er lettere for os landskabsarkitekter at opnå lydhørhed og anerkendelse af den forskel, vi kan gøre. Og der er meget, vi kan bidrage med. Hvor bygninger oftest er for nogen, ja, så er udemiljøerne, som byens rum og landskaber for alle. Det er offentlige rum, der binder byen sammen, og det er de uformelle mødesteder, samlingspunkter, vores sociale kontaktflade til, hvad der sker omkring os. Og det er også her, vi kan gøre en forskel for menneskers sundhed. Og det er også her, vi kan vi kan håndtere klimaudfordringer. Vi kan fremhæve rum og identitet. Skabe tryghed og tilgængelighed. Skabe levedygtige steder for mennesker og planter og dyr. Vores fag er indbegrebet af bæredygtighed. Klog landskabsarkitektur har taget højde for både miljømæssig, økonomisk og social bæredygtighed. Det er let at blive enige om her også fagfolk imellem. Det kan godt være noget vanskeligere, når vi skal overbevise andre. Ikke mindst, når der er kortsigtede økonomiske prioriteringer på spil. Men for at opnå fælles forståelse, for at overbevise omverdenen, ja, så har vi brug for fakta, for mønstereksempler og for rollemodeller. Og så kigger jeg over på dig, Torbjørn, for det er lige her, du kommer ind i billedet som rollemodel. For du kan med din erfaring inspirerer os til at gøre os klogere på, hvad der virker godt. Og måske også dele lidt viden om, hvordan du lykkes med at komme i mål med så fine projekter af så høj kvalitet. Så 10 tanker glæder vi os til at høre om. Umiddelbart efter Torbjørn, så bliver det mig en personlig glæde også at kunne præsentere studerende fra vores tre uddannelsesinstitutioner fra Københavns Universitet, KADK. Øhm, og øh, fra her fra Aarhus Arkitektskole og for øh, KU Science øh, på Frederiksberg. Fordi de har alle tre taget imod en udfordring. De vil nemlig hver især holde to minutters oplæg om det arbejde, som de gør lige nu og her. Og om de udfordringer, de har. Og jeg vil sige, og de muligheder, de ser i opgaverne. Jeg vil sige, jeg har i hvert fald nået at se lidt af det, og deres friske og kreative sind, kombineret med lærerkollegets viden om vores fag, det kan nemlig også inspirere os. Og så herefter er det slut i det her rum, og så er der lidt kaffe og kage bagefter. For nogen, vi skal gå videre over i kantinen. Ja.
lige præcis i kantinen på Nørreport 16. Og derefter begynder DL's generalforsamling. Men i hvert fald velkommen til alle, og velkommen til dig, Torbjørn. Ja, tak så mycket, eh, hör ni mina danska vänner. Ehm, och det är roligt att få vara här och väldigt hedrande att få vara här på det här årsmötet som generalförsamlingen som ni har idag. Och jag ska göra den här presentationen på engelska och det är inte för att jag vill verka märkvärdig eller att jag är speciellt bra på engelska utan det, det, det beslutet ligger utanför min kontroll som man säger och jag har förstått att det rör sig om att det, det kanske finns några Erasmus studenter här till exempel som inte förstår våra vikingspråk här uppe i norr men det kan också ha att göra med jag skrev just på ett, ett papper här om att eh, när det gäller den här videodokumentationen att ni kanske vad vet jag, ni kanske vill visa den här för någon ja. <laughs> någon som av någon anledning skulle vara intresserad av det här så, so, uh, is that okej? Okay? så so I'll try to switch in, into English because that was the agreement anyway so. um, I should say also that um, uh, th this will take around 45 minutes or so, I think, and uh, maybe we have a, 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 s a short session of, of questions afterwards or uh, um, things that you want to to object on, uh, uh, about or, or to have all kinds of comments that, that we could discuss a little bit afterwards. But um, the, uh, the, f the fun fundamental uh, structure of this presentation is that I will present you ten notions about landscape architecture that, that I have thought about a lot, I, I must say, and it, ha it has been fun to think about this also because it has helped me to try to um, have an argumentation with myself about my own decisions and I think that goes for all of you also so if you all would try to put down 10 notions about landscape architecture you would come up with certainly different ones than, than I have done but it's good for the discussion and I think it also means that instead of uh, showing project for you which should be quite egotistical which I try to avoid to be and then uh, have conclusions afterwards. We start with the conclusions, so that's the idea. So we start with 10 conclusions and then I'll try to exemplify these conclusions by projects of, of that we have done at my office. So that means that the, the project presentation is sort of fragmented actually. It, it's just, uh, it, it doesn't, it's not presented in its, in its full or um, uh, in all the nuances, but they just relate to these uh, 10 notions that I have sort of taken out so but the first image here I, I was wondering if is there possible that we could put down the light in the in the ceiling because I think the images reads a little bit better is that okay with you okay so the first this one I have to read to you because uh, you can't see it really but I found this button in an art store and it says that most things look better when you put them in a circle and that's one of those advices, you know, that, that's really handy to have. And if, if we could give out like 10 of those, this education, the training could be really short, you know, we would handle it in, in, in a fortnight, more or less. And uh, sometimes you feel that this would be wonderful if we could do it that way, you know. But then again, we would not have the magic of landscape architecture, we would not have the complexity, we would not have the, uh, the, the mystery and all the possibilities that we know uh, lies into the subject as such. So we know that this is impossible to, to do. But then again, you know, turning back to that, so what about if we still try to uh, draw some conclusions of, of landscape architecture? Would that help in any way? Would it, would it give us feedback to how we react to ideas and how we treat ideas? So that's uh, basically what I've been trying to do. Um, so um, 
you better just hold on and we go into the first one of these 10 issues about landscape architecture and some of them you might agree with and some of them not and some of them you will feel more sympathetic with probably and some of them are maybe a little bit more distant to you but this is at least my, my 10 notions so to say. So the first one I've called a big idea um, and this is this is not things that I have invented, of course. These are probably, and that's the point also, I hope they're kind of generic so that you could all uh, feel some kind of recognition in, in, in these uh, ten notions. And to have a big idea is, is very good to have in when you are put in, for, in, in front of a design commission. Um, and to have one main idea, one big idea that, that is the, the, the ruler that uh, conducts the design work, more or less. And then come secondary ideas of all kinds of things, of uh, uh, materials, of colors, of spaces, or whatever it is. But they should uh, subordinate themselves to the big idea and actually should support the big idea and that's one I, one way of getting a, a project I think th which owns clarity and uh, which is also self-explanatory you could say. So if we turn that around and say that if we have an abundance of idea, very many ideas, that tends to blur the concept. We don't really get what this is about and it also weakens the overall design. And as you probably many of you, you uh, think right now is also that there's a difference between idea, to my mind, and solution, right? Solution is for engineers. Ideas is for architects and landscape architects. So it's important also to know when we're working with solutions and when we're working with ideas. And in landscape architecture, it's a lot about ideas. So I have two projects trying to uh, demonstrate or display this thing about the big idea. And the first one is a textile and fashion university in uh, the Swedish city of Borås. Borås is more or less the equivalency to Manchester in, in, in UK. And uh, they have new quarters now. Borås is not so far from Gothenburg. And uh, we thought about trying to give this, this new school in, in old industrial uh, uh, surroundings an identity of sorts, so that people would recognize that uh, this is the entrance and also to recognize that this is a school of, of fashion and textile design. So the big idea here was to roll out a carpet in stone. And um, this carpet is 110 meters long and it's 11 meters wide. And it also, as we could sort of see here, um, it, it has uh, an entrance all the way over here. So this also, and these are the secondary ideas, this also works as a catwalk for the student exhibitions that they have there. They could have people walking around displaying their, their, their clothing and they have these benches where they can put things. So it also has a function, but the main idea is to make it um, uh, an identity to the school as such. And then comes other ideas, of course, uh, for instance, you know, what is this pattern? Uh, how big is it? How, what colors is it? How, how, how should it be constructed? How can I use the metaphor of textile, of weaving techniques and make it into stone, so to say? But those ideas come secondary, so the main thing is still to try to uh, create identity to the school. Uh, the second example that I have is uh, at another school. It's the Institute of Technology in my hometown, actually, which is Lund. It's located in, in southern Sweden, uh, just on the other side of the, of the strait between uh, uh, Sjelland and, and the Skåne. And um, any of you have been, have been there at the Lund Institute of Technology? Some of you have, yes. Uh, it's a sort of a spread out campus. There's no there there, you know. You can't really find where is, especially as a student, where do I go? Where do I hang out? Where do I, do I meet my friends? But there's one uh, place in, on the campus which was there already before the campus was even built, which is an old clay pit. 
and it's it's now it's it, it's it's a pond because it's been filled with water. But because it was a clay pit, that means that uh, the edges of this pond are very steep, so you can't really walk there. So the big idea of this project was to furnish the steep edges of this clay pit with uh, staircases, uh, sun terraces, uh, wooden decks, places to sit down, places to walk. So that was the, the main idea, so to say. And as you can see here, it was, it's sometimes rather dramatic, actually. And, and then come the secondary ideas as we try to have a, an upper little platform for, for stay and for social use. And then you can imagine walking down the staircase that you get a good glimpse of, of the water already from up there. And when you, when you descend down the stairs, but then there's uh, a 90 degree uh, change of direction and you go parallel to the water. So there's this almost Japanese, you know, they're really master in the Japanese art and garden designers with this kind of movement through a landscape and, and what you see and all of a sudden you turn and you see something different. So that is something that we have learned from, from there. So these are, are things that subordinate themselves to the big idea which is again to um, uh, furnish the uh, uh, edges, the steep edges, with, with different terraces and platforms and staircases. Okay. The second idea, uh, the second notion, I should say, um, it's a little bit hard to, to read, so I have to read it for you. It says, listen to the site. And this is one of the more important things that I think you all work with all the time, when, which really separates us from many of the building architects. There are building architects that are good at this also, but this is our home turf, you know, this is what we know, this is what we can. And it says there that the existing site, this is also what they call the genius loci, you know, that Christian Norberg Schultz wrote about the Norwegian theorists. The existing site gives valuable input and those inputs can be used in the design. So this is really what we need to do a good design. We need those, we need to identify those, uh, uh, those qualities. This information, however, is sometimes embedded, hidden and uh, ambiguous. You know, it can be climate, it can, it can be a tree, it can be a forest or a valley or a view, but it can be things like climate, weather, can also be abstract things. I think I wrote something about that afterwards. To in interpret the site, to be the interpreter of the site, that's the name of our game, <coughs> I would say. To, um, uh, to interpret the site profoundly, it should say, and, under, um, and, and to, to gain an understanding of the landscape is required. Uh, the inherent, qu inherent qualities of a site can also include ephemeral things, things that are hard to track down. That maybe you have to spend a lot of time there, maybe you have to come back several times. Um, and those notions can be memory, history and former use. And I have a, um, a few um, projects uh, to display that. And the first one is a, a project which is kind of old by now. That you, anybody been here to Malmö, to the Donia Park? It's quite, probably a few of you, it's, it's, it's quite published. And it sits right at the edge of the Öresund Strait, this park. And it's a, it's a park that uh, turns itself to the sea. So, um, in interpreting the site here means understanding that the whole park is just about the sea. Different ways to enjoy the sea. Different climates, different uh, hours of the day, different seasons, from different levels, from close by and from a little bit further away. And to try to make a drama out of this, we also worked with uh, different kinds of uh, design attitudes as, for instance, we actually uh, built a palisade around the whole park so you can't see this, the sea. So then what use would it be? Well, there are always places when this turns up and this again is a, a Japanese technique that they call hide and reveal and we could sort of tell that by 
when we walk on this this promenade here we can see these people up there and the light gives us a uh, um, a clue that there's an opening here and something is happening on the other side of this wall but we don't still don't know really what but it's it's wor worthwhile enough so that these people they sit there and watch it so we we realize that there's something waiting for us there and this is a way to create a sort of a choreography into the viewing of the sea instead of just showing everything at once and if you go up there um, this is what, what you see, and, and uh, uh, this is an October uh, day, actually, with calm weather, and the whole strait is uh, like a flat, silvery uh, mirror, almost. Uh, and not so many people visit, this is very different from in the summertime, so if you're lucky, you're almost alone here. And this has actually been, uh, over the years, this is almost 20 years old, this project, this place out here, um, uh, has constructed its own memories. You know, in the beginning there was this movie playing at the movie theater called Titanic. <laughs> you know, so, so there's almost like a, a body language when you go here. There's, in those days there was always some, somebody standing like that out there. Now they forgot about that film, so it's other things, you know, they, it's, um, um, that has developed over the years, so um, they have all, all kinds of, it's a popular place to dive into the water from, for instance, so it's a good place for, for youngsters and teenagers, which is a, a tricky group to plan for and to make, make in interesting environments for. So, um, the, the, the way that this park works with, with the views has been important for me, and it has to do with learning the site. Um, this is October, a couple of weeks later, um, this is what it looks like, uh, and, and this is what happens at places by the water that you in Denmark are so used to. And this is also the phenomena that makes life and experiences in the landscape worthwhile, right? This is a, a tough time to be by the coast, but it's also fantastic, it's majestic. You really feel the, the elements pushing and pulling in you, so it's, it's, a, it's a grand experience, uh, uh, of course. Okay, so that was the Dania Park. It's in Malmö, Sweden. Maybe I forgot to, to say that. This is uh, another project about listening to the site. It's a memorial grove in, um, in uh, Sweden, in uh, the same city as the Fashion University, actually, in uh, Borås. And uh, the situation here was that the parish, uh, Församlingen, they wanted a new memorial grove. You know about memorial groves, right? It's not uh, coffin graves, it's more uh, uh, crematorium uh, treated little urns and paper that you uh, put down under a turf in, in, in the grass. And um, uh, they wanted this memorial grove to be placed on a ridge with pine forests. And it overlooks plains uh, on the side that we could sort of see that whitish bluish is actually more the projector that makes that color. It's, a, it's snow. It's about this time of the year, actually, a couple of years ago. So the, the place is quite beautiful. It, it, uh, it's, it's dramatic in the way that it sits on a ridge, quite steep. Uh, it has these really good views and it has these valuable trees. And it's important to put the memorial grove in a way so that it doesn't destroy the values that we came there for. So, uh, and, and that is the profession that, that we all have, to try to make the, the best out of that. So what, what we did eventually, that we decided to, the first thing we decided to, um, uh, instead of having one memorial grove, we divided it up in, in five pieces. And that makes that you can build one and then uh, it goes into action and you bury people there and when that is uh, sort, of, sort of full you can build the second one and the third one. Um, and also uh, because the, the, the terrain is so steep we decided to work with something which is almost like a if you have a, a, a shelf in a cupboard, you know, if you, because the terrain is so steep we have to create a horizontal uh, plane. So we have five of these uh, shelves that you can draw out from the cupboard and each of the shelves they have 
uh, a few ingredients that are more or less the same but they look a little bit different so uh, there's the pathway going through there's the terrace that, that then shoots out of the steep terrain, as we can see. So there's a place where you can enjoy the view, which is important if you're in a sensitive emotional situation. It's a, research has shown that that's why people like looking over the sea, because when the, when the eye relaxes, the muscle relaxes, it doesn't have to focus, then you, it's a better situation for for meditation or for reflection and, and those kinds of things. That is important in a memorial grove. There's a place for the flowers, there's a, a bench, and there are, are uh, stone tables, you could say, on which the uh, name signs are put uh, for the deceased ones, so to say. So that was the, uh, um, th the idea. But then, about the, because this one is about listening to the site, we felt that this is impossible to draw at the drawing table. It's impossible to find those places with that view, avoiding those pine trees. So we decided to do the opposite, to work with the landscape first and on the drawing board afterwards. So we went out with a, with, with a sledgehammer and some sticks and some ropes and we selected the right places on site. The, uh, sorry, uh, this is uh, sculptor Paul Svensson who did a sculpture that we'll see soon. And afterwards we had a, a, a guy with one of those digital, you know, measuring machines, really fantastically uh, practical and he just boom, 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 shoot in all the, the, uh, uh, the sticks that we put out and w then we went back and, and went the other way around and took those data and put them on the drawing board. Uh, and then we could make the drawing afterwards, so to say. So that was the way that we tried to listen to the sites. And um, this is the way it came about in the end. That's Paul's sculpture. It's a, it's a boat, which is a metaphor for all kinds of things related to life and death. And the plains downstairs and the pine trees and the, and the, the terrace, as we can see. And the pool sculpture also has a polished uh, surface on the top, so it looks almost like water, which it actually isn't. And we could also see the name signs, the flower um, uh, trough, and the sofa. Okay. So, next uh, notion, I think it's, this is number three, I have called large scale. And um, this might change you know, because uh, these days maybe even sketch work, maybe even conceptual work begins in the computer. But for my generation, uh, originally we did everything on the paper and then came computers and working drawings and much of the work were done in computer which is having all kinds of, of advantages over it, as I must say. But at least uh, the way that I work and also my students because I have a, a part-time position as a, as a teacher at the Swedish uh, landscape school uh, also often students begin using their uh, when they do their conceptual sketches begin with a paper or their, their sketchbook and then I think it's advantageous to begin with a large scale and what is a large scale well in my mind it means a small paper you know, so it's, it's not uh, 1 to 50 or 1 to 10 or 1 to 25, it's maybe 1 to 1,000, maybe 1 to, 1 to 2,000 or 3,000. So the first conceptual sketches benefit from being in large scale. Ideas appear easier in large scale. Smaller scales are for design work. And idea work and design work are for me two different things, again. Uh, design work is if it's red or green, if it's narrow or, or uh, uh, round, if it's uh, high or low. Uh, concept conceptual work goes before that. So uh, design comes after. Design should support the idea. And that is again why ideas should come first, as I said, and design work come later. Large scales help avoiding slipping into design when working with ideas. I can't even read it myself. I have to redo these. Uh, 
So that's the, uh, the, the notion in this case, that try to avoid the big paper because that will just give you anguish, you know, that would scare us away. Oh geez, a paper as big as this table, how can I ever do anything interesting here? So that's something that help, has helped me a lot at least and uh, I have two projects uh, showing that and the first one is a park in Karlstad, Sweden not so far from the Norwegian border and this sketch is probably the size of a, a postcard or something like that it doesn't show details, it doesn't show design basically, but, but we, we can still interpret this sketch somehow and it's, it's, it's a fantastic um, pl place to work with it's a peninsula that looks like a bird's beak almost and it's the first time when this river, this quite mighty river, Klarälven, comes from the Norwegian border and it splits right here. This is the first splitting point, so it splits in an eastern uh, branch bifurcation and a western branch. And on that split there's this peninsula which is probably 400 meters from top to bottom. And we could already here see that there's a designer's idea of having something that are long ridges. Each of these are about 100 meters long. One, two, three, four. They came out to be five in the end, actually. There's an idea about something happening towards the western side, which is where we face sunset. And there's an idea of doing something very special on the, on the very tip of the bird's beak there. So, so those things ca came about in, in, a, in, in, on a small paper. So the ideas were easier to come, to come up in, on, on that um, scale, so to say. And we could also see here that these are the ridges. Um, and as it came about, um, the ridges create uh, viewpoints where you can have a, a, a view and in between are valleys and we made those valleys to be different uh, habitats. So one is the Magnolia Valley, another one is a Fern Valley and the third one is uh, something else. So uh, uh, this is the Fern Valley for instance. You get a sense of the scale in real life afterwards where we have the ridge racing to the, to the right and to the left and um, this image shows the western side um, uh, facing the sunset where there's a, a moonlight promenade you can say going away uh, towards the north and this is also where you where you enjoy sunset and you have all those light shifts and, and uh, you can also see that there's different uh, wooden decks that create sun decks and places to rest and places to, to stay by and, and social spots in short. So the next uh, project that I wanted to show you when it comes to begin sketching in, in small scale or big scale uh, is a campus park in Umeå which is, which is a, a, a city in Sweden quite far north, uh, a little bit south of the polar circle and this is again a sketch that was made maybe in something like a post, size of a postcard or maybe a little bit bigger. And it shows uh, vaguely that there, there's an idea of a pond and around the pond are different places, uh, sudden decks, uh, staircases that can uh, turn themselves in different directions. There's a staircase going up to uh, upper level here and there's a little island with a, a, a place where you can stop by here and on the southern side it's more complicated, it's more forested. Uh, so that's basically what, what we see. And uh, this stayed with the project more or less, so this is the final plan. We recognize the pond which was made by a dam down here. It's a river coming from here, or a brook rather. Uh, and we, we made a dam here so that the, the lake came about to be quite large. There's a little island and it's surrounded by the university buildings on all sides. So this is the student campus for instance with terraces uh, for coffee and, and, uh, and tea if you want or social life um, transmitting to, to, the, to the ground from the entrance of, of the building. So that's uh, how uh, the original sketch in large scale transferred into a more defined site plan 
and um, this is again when you are in the students union and you look out on the terraces that goes down to the ground and then further down you can see the pond with the bridge and the island and if we go down to that environment um, there's different kind of social places where you could gather around, which people do since it's a university. It also creates a meeting point between students and teachers and teachers and researchers. And uh, This is quite new in Sweden that the outdoor environment at a, a, a university is very important for social life but also for the learning process. Um, that we didn't have that very many years actually. It's, it's, it's old in the Anglo-Saxon tradition but in, in Sweden that's something that we have just discovered quite lately actually. And uh, although Umeå is quite far north, this is in October actually, and the next image is from a, ye uh, a month later, even in November. And admittingly not so many people move around in, in November but it's still inviting for promenades and to to uh, enjoy uh, fresh air and to walk around with a friend or with a uh, you know if you have a tutor when you're doing your graduate work or researcher discussing with each other maybe. Okay so next uh, notion I this is again something Japanese uh, borrowed landscape and a landscape architect, we were discussing that in, in the bus, and Jakob said that the, 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 the great advantage uh, with uh, being a landscape architect is that we're not working with singular pieces, uh, with the monuments or, or buildings. We're working with the whole world. You know, everything comes together. And uh, this uh, landscape architect, which is quite renowned over the world, Catherine Gust <coughs> Gustafsson, she says that if there's a sky, it's mine. So that goes for landscape architects, that if there's a sky, it's ours. So the contained area of the project, if you're given a, you know, a dotted line, that do your project inside this, this image here, can actually be expanded. And the limits can be widened. You can bring in the horizon, views, or distant features. And if you visit some of the old uh, promenade parks from the 18th century in, in Japan, the, you can, it's easy to see how the Japanese masters developed this into perfection. And to borrow, borrow from the surrounding landscape and make it yours, make it uh, belonging to the project, is something that they used so often that it became so elaborate so that they actually named it, uh, gave it its own term, which is shake. And I have two projects to show that for you. The first project, this is the only one that I'm showing you that wasn't realized. I, I had a, a position at the uh, university in uh, Switzerland, in Lausanne for a while, EPFL, École Polytechnique de Fédérale de Lausanne. And they wanted a, a, a walkway between the students' union and a, a hotel or uh, where the research students stayed, which was 200 meters down the road, so to say. And it was kind of a boring walk, actually, but it had one significant quality. It had this view of the Alps, as you can see here. So we discussed with the architects and said that, why don't we take the bi big building of yours, divide it into two, get an open gate so that we, we can see the, the, the view, we can get contact with the, with the lake downstairs and also the mountain and we can borrow that landscape and make it a quality while you, while you walk between the hotel uh, and the students union so to say. So that's one way of borrowing a landscape. This is another project, it's called the Sjöviks Torget, the Sjövik Square. It's situated in, in Stockholm. It's one of, of uh, not so many projects that I have in Stockholm. And there we uh, built a pier, which is 40 meters long, and it juts out into the uh, Lake Mälaren. And it, it points a direction that does that the whole fjord, you could say, and the distant islands of Stockholm comes into your project, so to say. So you borrow that view and make it part of the quality of the project itself. 
Uh, next notion uh, I have called an easy touch. It's, it's important to, to have an easy touch because especially if you work with sites that has an own beauty, an existing intrinsic beauty, um, then it's, it's, it's more especially important to have an easy touch in what you do. Um, it's often beneficial to avoid violent or bombastic moves or heavy-handed design. Uh, if you do that, you uh, take the risk of pushing away the qualities that are already there. So that's uh, something that I think that Swedes are, are pretty good at, actually. You know, if we... Uh, are there any Dutch people here? No, good. <laughs> because the Dutch, Dutch landscape architecture, to me, is very photogenic, you know, it wears really well and, and it does always has a, have a very strong idea but they do too much out of things and I think it, it, has, it has to do with that they, they gained a third of the country from the sea more or less, you know, so they have been forced to construct their landscape again. They don't have that much of, of uh, intrinsic beauty. They don't have that much of, of beautiful ex existing landscape. So that makes it sometimes, to me, a little bit too full with everything. But if you come to a project, if you get a project, a commission, where you have that natural beauty and those natural quality, uh, it's important to try to keep with those and to try not to destroy them. So um, this project uh, is uh, it's just a part of a project. It's also a project of historical significance. It, it's called the Winter Bay Park. Uh, Winterviken. It's in southern Stockholm and it's a place where Alfred Nobel, the, the person with the Nobel Prize, had his uh, industrial activity. So the industrial buildings, we can see one of them to the, to the left there, surrounds a meadow. And the med but the meadow is, uh, you, you can't really judge if it's just there or if it's designed in any way or what is it used for or how should I use it. So we did a, a very minor intervention there which was putting th these curb stones uh, in a fan shape like that. And this also has a function actually, so in summertime people sit down there, have their picnics, kids, they jump up and down, they have um, uh, events and theaters and concerts, and then they put out benches here, and they have the stage down here. And also, in winter time, it comes out to be a, a graphic pattern. You don't sit down, really, in the winter time, but it does give you uh, a, a sense of place, actually. It, it gives, does give you a message that this, this meadow is something that is designed and it's, uh, it's uh, appropriated to, uh, to a human activity somehow. Um, next uh, notion of the ten that I have I've called generous sizes. You know, architects, they often talk about the measurements of the body and uh, Da Vinci made this image of this person standing, you know, with hands spread out and, and legs in, written into a circle and a square. And this is very important for architecture. You know, the seats that you s all sit on there, probably 42 centimeters high to adapt to your body. And the doors are also uh, of a size so that you can go through it comfortably with the body that you carry around, but with the landscape this is different uh, the way I see it. The, the human body is not a relevant ruler in the landscape in the same way. So the accurate scale comparison in landscape is not what you are, it's more about what you can see. And that means that you have to use much bigger sizes of things. If you take interior design and put it outside, it becomes really minor and it doesn't uh, take the space that you want it to do. So I wanted to show you a couple of projects um, which demonstrates that. The first one is a panorama terrace and it's uh, located in a suburb in Stockholm which is called Rinkeby. And Rinkeby is a socio 
economical, quite weak area. So there's all kinds of social problems here. So it was also important to try to to design something in this environment that really adds to the to the confidence and maybe to the experience and to the to the uh, uh, to the people that that live here, so that they could feel that we also have some good places actually here. It's worthwhile to come to Rinkeby to see this panora panorama terrace. So that was uh, the ambition at least. And the terrace is this one, and it looks over a field, or actually a green wedge. Stockholm has 15 green wedges that penetrate the city, and this green wedge is probably, you know, 10 kilometers long or something. So that's a, an, a, that's a quality for the people in Rinkeby, which is over here, that they can have access to, to the field. But the way it's built, there's a, a <coughs> height difference between the upper level and the lower level. So this is really about how to get from the upper level to the lower level. And we try to make that in an in a experiential way, so that you would be able to experience something there. And it was through the, the viewing terrace, the panorama terrace, and then to come down, there's a very long road, it's 140 meters long, it has to be that because it, it has to follow dis the uh, disability. <laughs> And it also uh, creates something of, of a big size that fits into this quite big landscape. Uh, we built models, of course, that we often do, and this is the uh, panorama terrace as such, and this is the long way, it, uh, the road, the promenade. It's just for bikes and, and pedestrians. It continues way out here, and the way it came about uh, in real life is like this. So this is the terrace again. <laughs> and the view out over the field and uh, the promenade uh, goes down and meets the the field down here and it's actually designed as a false perspective so it's wider here and more narrow there so it looks almost even longer if you see it from this view if you come from down here it's the opposite of course uh, and also if you uh, go down on the field we try to and then now we're into design we tried to make the wall very rust rustic with the big granite stones. We tried to make the terrace uh, in different material and wood and uh, different uh, uh, planks of wood that separate themselves. So there's these dark slots uh, between them, right? So in the daytime, uh, the wood is light and the slots in between, they're dark. And in the nighttime, it reverses, so the slots become light and the wood becomes dark. So it's probably the biggest lamp in Stockholm, I would say, it's eight meters high there. So that's a way to how to work with, with big things, with big, big scale in the landscape. Okay, um, I think this is number seven, how are we doing with time? Well. I have to speed up a little bit. This one is design with dusk. This is not what architects can do, but landscape architects can because we're always outdoors. And dusk is a rich part of the day. Uh, a lot of interesting things happen at dusk. Shadows become longer and shifts in light pass by very much more quick than they do in the daytime. And they create a sort of a drama that you can follow almost with your eyes. In, in 10 minutes, you can see the change of, of light quality, change of light color, and change of, of a shadow length, for instance. So just spending an hour in a park, when day uh, transfers into night, you can see a, a wide variety of qualities that, that'll occur one after the other. And uh, uh, this is very, gratifying to work with uh, with dusk and it's also gratifying to work with a light designer that maybe could arrange so that you mix artificial light with the natural light in, in different ways. This is a project in Karlskrona, um, Karlskrona which is located fairly far south in Sweden, not so far from here and it's a small plaza, it's called the Fisketoyet, uh, Fish Market Square 
and it situated it sits uh, since it was formerly used as a place to s sell fish it sits just by the quay uh, where the boats would come in but that doesn't really happen anymore but it's it's a very good place to to see the sunset so people would gather here to to watch the sunset so it has a simple uh, layout actually with a uh, a promenade which is made in stone and it has a wooden structure which has seatings and there's a sculpture and then you can see out uh, over the, the the bay here and all the different uh, shades of, of colors that that comes uh, with with the sunset um, and we have tried as I said to also work with artificial light so there's like a box hanging out for the daring ones can sit here and, and have their their feet in the air and on the sides of this box uh, there are, are, are light coming out of, of the inner side of, of this box so to say creating a little bit of an atmosphere here that uh, gives um, um, attraction we hope to to the site and uh, this way of working with light not only for security reasons to make things uh, that must be there also you know you must have light so that you see where you put your feet and you don't fall around but there's also another way to work with light and these could exist parallel and that is to work with light as for ambience for atmosphere so we often use to we try to use light in both those those ways and this is the pier at Sjöviks toilet in Stockholm that I think we saw uh, a few images ago uh, and this pier does have a, a wooden uh, wall on the eastern side and inside that wall we have uh, lightings that, that gives a certain kind of um, atmosphere to uh, the people who, who uh, arrive here and to visit here. Uh, another, yet another uh, project, it's, this is in Malmö, which is even closer, um, Hylje uh, Torje, Hylje Square, and this is a place that didn't offer any inherent qualities really. It's a, a tricky project because there was nothing to to uh, to use there were no view no forest no no topography so it, it was uh, took more difficult I, I feel to work with those kinds of projects and projects that you have a lot of things to use that are already there so it's also somehow a square that is used a lot for events because there's a big arena on the shorthand side so we try to take that as a point of departure of doing something different with light so we have um, oops, we have uh, these masts that are surrounding the square on both sides and they carry almost three kilometers of thin steel wire like a spider's web and attached to these steel wires are 2500 lead diodes you know they're really small like a coin almost so they create a digital sky and they can also be uh, they can be directed by a computer so we try to avoid you know the Las Vegas kind of, of a, a spectacle but they they twinkle a little bit and, and they they look almost like a starry sky actually and then we if you have water in 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 your project like this water trough that we designed also then the reflections will go up and down and it'll create a, a special kind of atmosphere here okay uh, levels I think is number seven or eight yeah uh, and uh, <coughs> levels uh, when I went to school were seen more as a problem than as a benefit so if we had levels it was important to even them out and to smooth them out so you couldn't really notice them but I would say that levels are sometimes uh, a powerful tool for the, for the designer it's not only a problem so levels can be used to dramatize design and make things happen there and you can create something that that, cr that in, in turn creates a, a variety and if the site that you're working with lack gradients or levels you can actually also manufacture them so this is a project which is actually a garden 
Uh, it's in Switzerland, in Basel, which is the uh, capital of the world for drugs, for pharmaceutical company. So this is at the campus of Novartis, which is one of the biggest uh, drug companies in, in the world, actually. And they wanted a garden that should show the visitor where their activity come from. And uh, there are synthetic drugs, but most drugs, all drugs, originally come from nature, right? So they wanted a, a garden, a pharmaceutical garden, uh, like the, 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 the monastery garden that displays uh, the wonderful world of plants. So to give those plants a, a, a priority position in the garden, we, uh, because the, the, the ground is quite flat here, we uh, made a basin which is about 50 centimeters lower than the surrounding area. And that makes that when you walk around here, you see the flowers and the flower beds almost like a carpet, slightly from above. Or you see it as a, as a, uh, a painting even maybe. And then you could walk over on, on these thin bridges here, which is a little scary. So basically you see it from the side and it makes the the plants more precious and that was what we wanted to do um, to display the uh, the singular plant as important for uh, the garden and for the drug company and we furnished that very edge and tried to make it as sophisticated as we could so it's a little bit higher and then there's a pattern here that comes later this is only design this is not idea and uh, between those uh, irregular slabs there are bronze bars that we patinized and on each one of those it says what is the name of that plant so this is crocus vernum as you can see here and all those have have uh, uh, plant description so that you know what is growing uh, on in, in the basin so this was a way to celebrate you can say the uh, the singular plant and how important it is for um, this industry of Novartis. Novartis is a special place. I think there, there's no place on earth that has this high concentration of, of, of architects, high quality architect, architecture and landscape architecture. So they invite people to come there and to, uh, to do buildings or mostly buildings but also landscapes. So here is another image showing you the idea of of the sunken basin. Okay. Number nine, I think, is mind the edges. Edges are important. It's often uh, where you want to be. Uh, that's where social life happens. And then you have the plaza itself in the middle, so to say. And, and this goes for nature as well. If you walk in the forest, the most uh, interesting uh, part is with the highest biodiversity is the edge between the open and, and the forest so to say and uh, if we move to the urban space this kind of life that we sometimes call the the, the, the theater of, of the street or, or of the plaza the see and be seen life is a core quality uh, in in the public public uh, realm and if the designer has pre precautions about this, uh, it prepares for those kinds of situations where you um, uh, use the edges for, for social life. And uh, I picked this Plaza Sjöviks toilet that we have seen a couple of times before with a, br with a pier that juts out to exemplify this. And the middle of the plaza is more or less flat and then there's two wooden decks, one to the west and one to the east, that frames this plaza. And these are the edges. And this western deck, it, it transfers into sun deck here, and here it transfers into the pier. And then there's all kinds of other details that we won't go into now, really. And I try to uh, work with this in a way so that it gives variation. So this is a uh, very long bench, it's 40 meters long on the pier as you can see and we're looking back to the square itself. Um, I have recognized and so have you also probably that if you buy a two meter 
sofa and there's one person already sitting there uh, there's something you don't really want to sit beside somebody that you don't know if there's a sofa which is just, just two meters wide. So I, I seldom use those sofas and we try to make really long sofas. So this is another one uh, which is quite long and that makes that a little party of five can sit here and then there's a group of two and then there's somebody else here on the side. So you space uh, much more people that way than if you have uh, 10 sofas of two meters length. And we also try to furnish these edges so that they're becoming attractive. This is a hint, I guess, to Sieti Hosevelsen in his laburnum garden, a little bit. So there's a, a laburnum um, multi-stem row of, of trees on the one of the uh, uh, edges. On, on the other edge it's, uh, it's, uh, it's furnished and designed somehow different. And this is how it looks like as, as a whole, so to say, with the western edge without the laburnums, with other trees, and the eastern edge is over there with the laburnum trees. And there's the, the pier and the sun terraces are over there. Okay. So last issue now, last notion about uh, landscape architecture, um, I have called reuse. And I have two examples to, to show you that. And this has to do with sustainability. I'm really tired with the word of sustainability because it, at least in Sweden, it seldom gives a, a definition of itself. It's just everything should be sustainable, sustainable, whatever you do, and you always search for what is sustainable, really. Uh, if you're an engineer, it's easy, you know, it's uh, minimize uh, carbon uh, ex exhausts and uh, minimize, uh, maximize this and that, but in landscape architecture it's much more subtle, I think. Landscape architecture is sustainable by definition, you could say, but still we, I think we have to explore what uh, uh, sustainable, sustainability means for us. And I think one definition could be, of course, to reuse things that, that, that we we didn't, we already used, but has lost its, its function, so to say. And uh, one of the projects that I have worked with is an industrial heritage landscape. It's a, a, a big industrial area deriving from the 17th century in um, the city of Norrköping, which is in central Sweden, is called Holmensbruk. And uh, at that site there was a, a 60 meter long oil container and the, the, the width, the diameter of that oil container was probably three and a half meters or something like that. And it, it lied on a shelf facing a waterfall and the tube was not in use anymore. They didn't use it for oil con containing. Um, so what we suggested was to cut that tube open and to open the ends of it so you can walk through it as a tunnel and by cutting it open you could get views to the outside so it's a like a big dinosaur actually which is resting there and you walk inside the belly of the dinosaur and we geared it with light and we furnished it with benches and a, a floor that you could see through and seating as I said and this historical uh, ruin you could say all of a sudden uh, became uh, relevant again because it had a new meaning from what it used to be, used to have. So today the visitor can walk inside this reused tube and get views towards that, that waterfall. So uh, the way it looked like the whole industrial area is, is quite big. It's, uh, it's around a river as you can see and the site is uh, right here actually. You can't really see it. The, the tube rests on a shelf in the shadow here. So this is just to give you a magnitude of that whole area. And there it is, uh, the, the tube that we cut open and open the end so that you can walk inside and get a view of that waterfall. And this is what it came about to be in, in the end. And uh, it's, it's a good place as it is now. It's one of those places that gives the whole industrial area its um, identity. So this is where people want to go when they want to visit the, the Holmensbruk, so to say. I have a last uh, project when it comes to reuse, and that's another memorial grove. 
and it's located in Gothenburg. It's quite a new project. It was in all, uh, opened uh, earlier uh, 2017. And the situation is that it's an old cemetery up here. And I say up because here is a retaining wall, which is five meters high. <coughs> And they wanted a memorial grove. And the church is up here also, the old church. And there was a place we found that they didn't use for anything. It was more used as a dump for old uh, uh, landscape maintenance stuff, like branches and, and leaves and, and things. And they dumped it in this ravine down here. And this was then where we cleared out the ravine and made it into the new memorial grove. So it's a reuse of an old area which wasn't in use anymore, but did become a new meaning, so to say. And you, this is from standing on the upper wall, looking down of, of the, on the uh, memorial grove down below. Um, and the whole idea is to make it into a bowl with the lowest point is a little pond and there's a terrace here for uh, putting names on, on those signs and also to put candles on these uh, walls here and uh, then there's also a possibility to walk around and the whole uh, place is terraced so that you can put your, your uh, uh, urns in, in the different horizontal terraces here. So these are important uh, ingredients, I think, in, in, in modern life, because we all, all of us have people, relatives, mothers, fathers, maybe sisters and brothers, or in the worst case, even maybe a child who has passed away somehow. And these, place should, these places should act as supportive uh, devices to help us through the hard times and make us believe that there still is a light morning coming after 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 today, so to say. So they they span the uh, the gap between memory and future, you could say. So that's uh, why uh, memorial groves are, are really uh, important places, and they should be very carefully designed. And it also has a. a uh, night uh, uh, aspect to it. Okay, so this was the last image actually, and uh, as I began with saying uh, what we have been, I don't know how you think this worked, but I tried to cut the cake the other way. Instead of beginning with a project and draw the conclusions, I began with the conclusions and tried to exemplify them with a project. And if you would have made your own ten notions about landscape architecture, they would probably have been quite different, but it is good to try to do that sometimes, especially if you're in practice, I feel, because you're so busy all the time, you don't have time to reflect that much, so sometimes it's good to go back and ask yourself, so how did that come about, really? Why did I do that? What kind of thoughts were formulated in our head at the office when we uh, designed that landscape project that we were so happy about afterwards? Okay, thank you.